you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, I am loving studying uh, Revelation. And one of the good things that comes out of Revelation and the study and being sick is I'm not preparing three sermons a week as I normally do because of the limitation in, in speaking. My doctor just wants me right now to speak once a week. And so it gives me more time in Revelation. And I promise you folks, I, I pick it up every day, seven days a week. I am studying Revelation and I am enjoying that. And God has even given me some things that I've, I've taught it two, two times before. And uh, he is just illuminating scriptures for me. And he reminded me this week of how important every word in the Bible is. You skip a word and you can change the context. And we need to look at every word in the Word of God and not just listen, not just, I mean, read, but to listen to what the Lord is trying to say to us. And so today I want to start in talking about the seven churches, the seven churches. And as you think of this, uh, obviously we spoke last week, Jesus Christ uh, was speaking in chapter 1, and he was the one that gave John the words to say, and John uh, penned the words of Revelation. And John was over 90 years old, and uh, he had lived a full life. He's the, the only disciple that was still alive, and God was using him. And, and by the way, uh, senior adults, we never retire, folks, all right? We're always about the Lord's work, okay? I understand retiring from work, okay? But I'm telling you, you can be as effective, if not more effective as a senior adult because of the wisdom and the life that God has given you. So he pins this, and you have to understand there's a twofold purpose in this. One, he is literally writing to the churches, those seven churches that we spoke about in those seven different periods of history. And of course, uh, the first church is the church of Ephesus, okay? And, and the, the church there was the mother church. Uh, it was uh, a church, uh, you know, that was just kind of the leadership uh, as far as size and maturity. And all the other churches kind of followed from and was a mission of the church at Ephesus. But not only was Jesus talking to the churches, he was talking to us as individuals, okay? What we say today applies to our church also, but it applies to us personally. So please keep those two things in mind, in mind as we study uh, the book. Let me give you the outline if you have your bulletin with you. The title of the message is The Loveless Church. The Loveless Church. And it wasn't that they didn't love God. It was just their love for God had kind of grown cold. Okay? And you know how new Christians are. I love to be around new Christians. They're just fired up about everything. They're excited about going to church. They're excited about uh, singing praises to the Lord. And I'm not saying you're not, okay, because you've been saved a while. But sometimes, and, and this is kind of something that I want to always guard against in my life, I don't want to be what I call a punch-the-clock Christian, okay? I don't want to be where I'm just coming to church because I'm supposed to come to church. I don't want to be where I'm reading my Bible because I'm just supposed to read my Bible. Folks, Jesus himself said that he has come that he may give us abundant life. And it's just like, uh, you know, uh, uh, being married. And, you know, when you first get married and then you're that honeymoon period and you're just, oh, oh you know, you're just you know, all over them and just surfy and going on and goo-goo eyes and can't wait to see you, honey. Mm, me too, honey. And all that thing's going on. <laughs> now, I hope y'all have experienced this in life. <laughs> and what could happen, I'm not saying it does happen, what could happen as we grow older, we don't have that same fire and, and we don't have that honeymoon stage. Well, listen, folks, I'm telling you, God deserves our love. And this talks about a loveless church. Uh, number one on the outline, the commendation. The commendation. 
And I, I wrote beside that good news. All right? Usually when you are going to have to give some bad news, and somebody asked me, they've asked me before, uh, you want the good news or the bad news? Give me the good news first. And I know they're opposite of that. Because the good news kind of softens the bad news. So the accommodation. Number two, the concern. Jesus did have a concern over the church churches. And then number three, the command. And with the command means something that we need to do, something that we must do. And you know, a simple definition of the word church is a called out group of believers. A believer is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Anyone can claim the name Christian by their own definition. There are a lot of definitions of what a Christian is. But the greatest characteristic of a Christian is love for our Lord and Savior. Jesus himself challenged his disciples to make their love for him the highest priority in their lives. Matter of fact, if you read the calling of the disciples, they left all and followed Jesus Christ. The problem for most Christians is that the intensity of that love can fluctuate from high to low. There are times when we're on fire for the Lord, but there are other times that we are just uh, punching the clock in Christianity. Every church is made up of Christians, so to be most effective in doing the Lord's work, the more Christians we have on fire for God, the more true ministry can be accomplished. Let's look at what Jesus said about the church of Ephesus. And by the way, the church of Ephesus uh, was a very important city in Asia, uh, just giving you some historical things. It was a harbor city located at the junction of three major roads. It was populated with over 300,000 people. And folks, that is huge in that day. Ephesus also was a wicked city where pagan influence were in abundance. A huge temple where they worshiped the goddess Diana was located there. It was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. There were also several smaller pagan temples where hundreds of female priests who were basically temple prostitutes operated. The church in Ephesus was the largest and most established churches, uh, church of the seven churches. It was planted uh, by Paul on his second missionary journey. If you remember studying Acts, Aquila and Priscilla was the ones that evangelized them first. And it was also where Paul went on his third missionary journey, and he spent three years there, which is the longest place he stood in all three of his ministry journey, mission journeys. It, it, it was the most time he spent there. Uh, Timothy pastored at Ephesus after the Apostle Paul, and John pastored there before he was in exile on the island of Patmos. The word Ephesus means desired, desired, which means... You know, when you think of the church of Ephesus, uh, it was one that, that God was very, very proud of at one time. In its beginning, it was a spirit-filled, evangelistic, missionary-sending, God-fearing church. But according to Jesus in our text, something had changed. Let's look at uh, the first of the seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3. Revelations 2, verse 1, and to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Notice the words are Jesus' words. Okay, that's in red writing. And when it talks to the angel, I, I kind of explained this last week. Uh, I believe every church has a guardian angel. Okay, I believe there are angels watching over us and watching over our church. But in this particular instance, it also can mean pastor leader. Okay, every church has pastors and pastor leaders, and we are called uh, to, to preach the Word of God. We are called to minister to the church body. We are called as the shepherds uh, of the flock. So he is writing to, I believe, the pastors, and it says, write, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hands. And last week at the end of the sermon in verse 20, he said the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, which literally means God has his hand on the pastor leaders. 
he calls them out specifically, okay? And I understand you extended me, and I came in view of a call. But God, uh, God did. God uh, made that happen. Matter of fact, when I voted, when they voted, the vote was 53 to zero to call me to the church. All right, and it says, "Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands?" And again, the lampstands are the seven churches. We are the light of the world, and Jesus needs to be right in the middle of everything we do. Verse 2, I know your works. Folks, God knows everything about us. There can be nothing hidden from God. He knows when we get up. He knows every word we say. He knows every thought we think. That can be scary at times, okay? But God knows everything about us. And he's speaking to the church. I know your works. Uh, there, there is a works that go on here. And the works are the ministries that go on here. We have so many ministries going on. It is amazing how many ministries that we have going on. Every day, every day we give out, every day that we are open, we give out food. And all these other things, uh, you know, we are collecting for the heart-to-heart -heart thing. There's things going on all the time. We have the youth that once a month go down and they feed, uh, you know, at the Gospel Rescue Mission. And all these things are going on. I know your works and your labor, and your labor. It's, it's, it's hard work, okay? Uh, you know, going on a mission trip is not easy, folks. You're out of your element. You're not, you're not in your routine. You're not sleeping in your own bed. You're not. But yet we go because God tells us to go. And it says your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and not and have found them liars. The first thing that God does or, or that Jesus says is, man, what you're doing is good. The work that you are doing is good. The work that you are doing is not easy. You are fulfilling the Great Commission. You are doing what I ask you to do. And so he gives them the good news and the, and the accommodation. But also, uh, the second thing that he talks about is you defend the Word of God. Folks, in this day in which we live, we are going to have to defend the Word of God. We cannot compromise. We, we will look at it and the world will say one thing and the Word of God will say something else. And matter of fact, the only place in these seven churches that he spoke of where he speaks of an apostle, okay, someone who called himself an apostle had come into the church and was teaching false doctrine. And folks, we must stand against anything false doctrine. People want to say that, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with the homosexual lifestyle. Well, folks, the Word of God says something different than that. People want to say that abortion is okay. It's not okay, folks. Life begins at conception. And as the world goes on and on, they're going to throw these things in our faces, and I, I promise you, eventually, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us something to serve the Lord. Hold your finger there and go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 with me. 2 Timothy 4. Look at verse 2. Preach the Word. Do you realize that you preach the Word every day of your life? You say, well, wait a minute. I don't stand up behind a pulpit. I don't stand on a street corner. Folks, people are watching everything you do. They're watching everything you say. They're watching how you react. So we are preaching the Word. All of us are preaching the Word. I am just the spokesperson, okay? I am God's messenger to the church. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. What does it mean? Always be ready. Man, people say certain sentences, you know, and, and it, your, your spiritual ears ought to go up. When somebody just says, says something like, you know, I'm a little afraid to die. Ooh, Scott, here we go. All right? Hey, I can help you with that. And we go into a gospel presentation. Preach the Word 
Be ready in season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Long suffering is patience. And there was two things this church was commended for was for their patience and for their perseverance. Folks, we're going to have to have perseverance as we continue in this world. And it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned into fables. Folks, I am telling you, you need to watch and you need to monitor who you are listening to. If that person's lifestyle does not line up with the Word of God, if their teaching does not line up with the Word of God, you do not need to be listening to that person. And here in verse 3 it says, for the time will come. Folks, the time has already come. We have folks that believe even in, in pulpits right now, there are homosexual churches and homosexual pastors. And folks, I'm telling you, that is, and again, people say, well, you're just judging. No, I'm just telling you what the Word says. It's what the Word says. And folks, we must stand. Love the sinner, but even in our text today, Jesus says, I hate this sin. And we'll talk about it here in just a minute. Now, verse 5. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Listen to me, folks. Every one of us have a ministry. You may not think you have a ministry, but God has something that he has called you to do. And I've said this ever since I came here. If everyone in our church would just do one thing, one ministry for the Lord, we would never have a need in ministry in our church. God saved you. He gifted you. He gave you a spiritual gift. And we all need to be about that ministry. Now look at back in the rest of this, this verse. Look back in uh, Revelation 2, 3. You have, per, you have uh, per persevered and have patience and have labored in my name's sake and have not become weary. Folks, I'm telling you, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how hard the ministry gets. It doesn't matter how hard life gets. God gives you the strength to go on, and God gives you the strength and the wisdom that you need. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look with me. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, Paul writing to the church at Corinth says, but we have this treasure in, earth, in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. What is this treasure that we have? Well, folks, we got God watching over us. We've got Jesus inside of us and being an example for us. And the power he's talking about is the Holy Spirit power. You can do more than you think you can do. You can endure more than you think you can endure. God, that whole Holy Spirit, the word is dunamis, which means power. Power. He has that power, and we have that power in us. Now look at verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, uh, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Sometimes life is going to beat us up. Sometimes people are going to be rude to us. Sometimes people are going to make fun of us because we, we are church folks and we go to church. Folks, don't take that personally. Don't take it personally. Matter of fact, if somebody calls me a Jesus freak, you know what I'd tell them? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed. Folks, that's what these folks, they were going through persecution. We talked about uh, the, the Roman Caesar then. Uh, he had put many, many people to death. But in these times, they stood strong. In places of the adversity, they stood strong. Now look at verse 10. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, 
that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. Two things about that, folks. Hey, Jesus went through more persecution than we will ever in our lifetime. His whole life, the three years, all they did was persecute Jesus. All they did was call him names and called him a liar and a false prophet. And, and then they uh, crucified him. And folks, Jesus was God in human flesh. When he was crucified, it would be the same if we were crucified. And Jesus got through that for you and I. So there is no situation in life most likely that you're going to go through what Jesus went through in his flesh and hit his body. Plus, it also says, the Bible says in Hebrews, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So what do we have? We have Jesus' example himself. And we have the Word of God. I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. So the accommodation, the good news was, Jesus was saying, you know what? Man, y'all started out good. Y'all y'all done some great things some great things. But you also have to understand the time in which this was written. It was A.D. 30 to A.D. 100. So now we're not talking about Peter and, and Paul and all of them. Those have already, folks have already died. So now we're talking about second generation Christians. And folks, here's what really bothers me and probably scares me more, and I don't want to use the word scared as fear, but what I observe is what one generation does in moderation, the next generation does in excess. So these folks that think this world's going to get better and better, you're not reading what I'm reading. You're not reading the Word of God. Folks, the end is coming, and it's going to get worse and worse. And we have to understand, and that's what he was saying. He was saying, you know, you can't go always and lived in the past. Well, you know, in not you know in the 80s we did this or in the 90s we did this. Folks, that is already past. We need to live for God today. We need to do what God says today. We need to manifest Jesus Christ in everything that we do. So we see the accommodation and the next thing we see is the concern. And I I'm amazed that the current concern is just one verse. I mean, it's, it encompasses more than that. But this verse, I'm telling you, it just stuck out in my mind and in my reading. Look what verse 4 says. Nevertheless, <laughs> it's one of those, you know, somebody will tell you all these things. Man, you're doing a great job. You're doing this. You're doing this. But I need to share something with you. And, I, and sometimes when certain people say that, my inside voice is, here we go. Okay, Jesus said, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. And folks, I think the Word of God is very clear on the kind of love that we should have for our Lord and Savior. And the reason I say that is because it's the kind of love that He has for us. God's love is unconditional love. He loves us just the way we are. He doesn't want us to stay that way. He knows that we have faults and we have weaknesses, but He loves us anyway. His love is unconditional. And, you know, uh, you can think of the prodigal son and the example that father set for his son. His son did everything wrong, just everything. But yet, when he wanted to come home, when he wanted to get right, his his father accepted him again as his son. And there's three types of love, and we know these. There's an eros love, and that is love. That's me. It's all about me. It's where we get the word ego. I'll love you if you love me. I'll love you if you do certain things for me. I'll love you, and all those eros love is conditional love. Then we have phileo love, and the phileo is friendship love. You know, we can be buddies, we can be friends, and we have, and, and I do, folks, we, we all have many, many, many acquaintances and, and friends, 
But the love he is speaking about here is agape love. And that agape love is willing to die for someone else. Folks, that's the kind of love God had for us. He sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. He sacrificed his only son, the perfect son of God, who had never done anything wrong, was crucified for you and I. That's how uh, serious and that's how deep the love of God is. And so if he gives us that kind of love, wouldn't you think when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and folks, in relationships, love is the most important thing. Love and trust. We put our faith and trust in God. But love keeps us together. Love uh, binds our hearts together. Love is where we share everything together. Love is where we think about others first. And he says, you have left your first love. And folks, it's an indictment to the church. It's an indictment to individuals for somebody to say, you don't love me like you used to. And God is here saying we need to love God the way He loves us. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Jesus was speaking to a lawyer. Look at verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. And folks, don't, don't test God. Don't test Jesus. All right, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What is that? It's every bit of you. It's the total person. It is that agape love, that deep love, that unconditional love. And you invite Jesus into the, your heart. That's why I believe the heart is the first thing. You have to have Jesus in your heart to love like he loves. Then it says with all your soul, your soul is your being. It's who you are. It's your makeup. It's, it's your DNA. It's everything about you. I want to be all in. I don't want to just kind of love someone. I don't just want to spend a few days with someone. I want to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. And folks, I am telling you, the battle is in the mind. It is in the mind, and we have to keep our minds on heavenly things and keep our minds on God, keep our minds uh, straight and, and keep our minds in the Word of God. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. Spend time with God. And we should love God. People ought to know that we love God. They ought to know that every Sunday morning uh, my truck's leaving my driveway and I'm going to church. They need to know that if, if, if they need me, if they call on me, I'll be there to help them. We need to love the unlovable. Even Jesus said that and showed that. So he says, you have lost that love. And folks, you can get it back. I have good news for you. But Jesus said, you must, you must put me first and foremost in your life. Look at verse 38. For this is the first and great commandment. Oh, folks, anybody can say, I love you. Any human being that can speak can say, I love you. But it, it's, it's true, folks. It's not just tell me you love me. Show me you love me. And folks, God needs to be first in our life, and he needs to be foremost in our life. And I can think of an example in John chapter 21. Look at John 21. Jesus had come back in post-resurrection time. And he spent 40 days here on earth. And he just popped in and out to the disciples. And, and here uh, he was going to you know, really minister to Peter. Because Peter, if you remember what he said, 
you know, earlier before the crucifixion and the trial and around the fire, he said, Lord, I'll die for you. Nobody's coming and taking you. I'll die for you. And folks, words are cheap, folks. Anybody can say that. But are you willing to do that? And we know that, that Peter uh, three times denied Jesus Christ. And I know uh, he was a Christian, okay? He wept bitterly. When he heard that uh, rooster crow, I'm telling you, it was this Jesus' words were echoing in his head. And by the way, folks, Peter was the spokesperson. He was the most effective disciple Jesus had. But he had messed up. He had denied Christ. And so this intimate time with Peter, Jesus is restoring him. Look at verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Jesus is asking us today, do you truly love me? Truly love me. Not lip service. Okay? Not... I love you on Sundays. I mean, his words were penetrating Peter's heart. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Kind of confident on this one. I, you know I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And again, we don't have time to dissect that. He, he was speaking of ministry. Uh, you know, Peter was going to be the spokesperson. Peter uh, was going to preach and 3,000 people got saved. Jesus was just uh, getting him ready for that. In verse 16, and he said unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And I'm thinking about this time, Peter's thinking, why did he ask me that the second time? Why do you ask a question? I mean, the very same question the second time. Either you didn't understand their response or you didn't really believe their response. Okay? And he said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? It hit Peter right then in the face. I said I would die for you but I proved that I wouldn't die for you. And here's what I'm saying, folks. It's not a matter of life and death. Because I'll tell you something, to a Christian, the easiest thing to do is, is to die. And I know most of you don't think that. But the easiest thing to do is die. Why? Man, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you know what the tough thing to do is? is to live for Him. Live for Him. Every day of your life, everywhere you go, no matter what situation comes up in life, no matter what you are doing, people need to know, I love God more than anything. And I know sometimes, even in our vocations, even in my vocation. And I tell you, staff wives, you know, if anybody probably gets ripped off, it's the staff wives. It's because Lori never knows when I'm going to come home. Not that I'm not coming home. I always come home. <laughs> Maybe that didn't sound right. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, she's always waiting on me. When we get ready to leave church, she's always waiting on me. When I'm visiting the hospital, she's always waiting on me. And folks, it takes true love to understand. And I promise you, if you ask Lori, she knows that God is number one in my life. I've been called to a vocation. I'm putting God first in everything. But does not the Bible say that we are all priests? We are all the divine order of God? And I understand that more is expected of me. But I don't think it is when it comes to loving God. We should all love God more than anything else in our lives. So he shares this concern. And then the last thing, 
he shares is the command. The command. Look at this last part. It says three things he tells us to do, and we'll do these quickly, all right? Number one, remember. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do your first works. Remember, okay, the way it used to be. Remember when you first got saved. Remember the excitement that you had. Remember all these things. He gives you three things to do. And then he says repent. You know what repentance is? It means you are walking in one direction. And normally when we have to repent, we are walking away from God in some form and fashion. And we turn around and we just go right back to God. Right back to salvation. Right back to where we stepped in. And I know there's situations in life that gets us down and they seem like it's unfair and we wonder sometimes where God is. And let me tell you where God is. God is where you left Him. He's right there with you. So we must remember, we must repent and do the first works or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So we repent. I mean, we remember, we repent and we return we go back to the place where we left God. And we make Him number one in our life once again. And again, this thing about removing our lampstand, you can look at the Old Testament and you can look at the church where, where even God uh, put Ichabod on the door. And He just said, my spirit is not here anymore. And I'm telling you, that is a scary thing for God's spirit not to be in a church. And we don't want that, church. And you don't want that in your own life where you are not sensitive to God's Spirit and you don't feel Him and you don't, you, you don't know Him like you used to and, and these things that used to bother you and these sins that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. But look at verse 6. This you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nickelodeons, which I also hate. And again, briefly, Nicholas was one of the apostles that was self-appointed. And he was trying to lead kind of a, 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 you know, kind of a division in the church at Ephesus. And one of the things he wanted to do was go back to the deal where we're going to have bishops, we're going to have archbishops, okay, we're going to have cardinals, and we're going to have a pope. And folks, I'm telling you, that is not the way God set up the New Testament church. And the second thing was he endorsed sensuality, okay, because of the sex gods and the temples and all that went on here, he basically separated the physical uh, from the spiritual. And here's his thought. His thought was, hey, God gave me this feelings. God gave me these feelings. So if I get these feelings, I just need to carry out what I do. Well, folks, my Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. My Bible says that the marriage bed needs to be undefiled. My Bible says I don't need young people to have sex before marriage. And so they were teaching these things, and the church stood for what was right. Verse 7, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to you, eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Oh, folks, Psalms 51. Psalm 51. Folks, we've, we've got to do this. You've got to do this. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It just simply means you are not as close to Christ. That fire is not burning in your life. You are just punching the clock. You are just going through the motions of Christianity. And if you remember what Psalm 51 was written about, that was David, and he made peace with his sin with Bathsheba. And for one year, he did absolutely nothing about it. And God sent Nathan and said, you are the man. Now look at verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgression your ways. And folks, I pray that you haven't lost that joy in your life. The joy of that relationship with Jesus Christ. That joy of coming to church. That joy of serving and ministering 
in helping others. Then I will teach your transgressions your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Have you noticed the last thing? People will start getting saved around you. It will be caught. It'll be caught. Your enthusiasm, your love for God, your example, it'll be a shining light in a dark, dark world. 2 Timothy 4, and I close with this. I hope you can say this in your personal life. I have fought the good fight. 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Oh, folks, I am telling you, you can get that back. You can get that back. I read this quote this week, and it has been said, to come to Christ costs you nothing. To follow Christ costs you something. But to serve Christ costs you everything. And folks, we need that kind of love for our Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for this day. and God, I thank you for the church at Ephesus. And God, I thank you that at one time it was. It was a lifeline of ministry in that area, in that place. And God, I just pray that we will not be guilty of losing our first love. God, I pray that we would keep you number one in our life. And Lord, today, maybe Christians need to come to this prayer altar or maybe they need to publicly rededicate their life to Christ and get that zeal back, get that fire back, get that joy back in serving. God, I pray if there's one person here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that you would just speak to that person and I pray that they would realize, Lord, they can have peace about dying. They can have peace about living for the Lord and they can invite you in their heart and you will forgive them of their sin. And God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would convict hearts in souls this day. Maybe those need to come for baptism or even those for church membership. This is your church. Lord, you're in the midst of it. You're here. Your presence is here. God, just help us to get out of the way. Just help us to love you with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our bodies. And God, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.